Okay, so good morning. So, welcome to the last class of this course. Okay. So, thus far we have been looking at various aspects of uh, atmospheric science. The first few weeks we looked at the earth system, the various components, right? The atmosphere, the cryosphere, the mantle, the oceans, uh, land and all that. Okay. And then we spent a considerable amount of time in atmospheric thermodynamics, where first we started defining the various quantities. The most important is the hydrostatic equation, okay, the hydrostatic equation which gives the relationship between pressure and height and with which we are able to use pressure as a proxy for height. Then you define a scale height for the atmosphere, 7.5 kilometers and then we went into moisture thermodynamics where we define relative humidity, uh, specific humidity, mixing ratio and all that. Then we went to this QT lawn P chart and then we spent a lot of time on that potential temperature, this temperature, all that, right, wet bulb, potential temperature, wet bulb temperature, dew point and we worked lot of problems, <coughs> we worked out lot of problems, looked at various phenomena. One interesting phenomena which we studied was the Chinook wind, which the very cold wind on one side, cold wet wind on one side, rises over the mountains, sheds its moisture, comes out as hot and dry, okay. So we have seen all that and then uh, we went into the second law. We went into the second law of is it open? We went to the second law of thermodynamics, looked at entropy and all that. And the most important thing was the Clausius Clapeyron equation. The Clausius Clapeyron equation, which lets you uh, look at the uh, change in vapor pressure with respect to temperature. And I also asked a problem in one of the quizzes. I think Mount Everest, at what uh, Mount Everest, what will be the boiling point of water and stuff like that you can. After that, we went into a very important chapter namely radiation, atmospheric radiation. We looked at the wave theory, the photon E is equal to H nu and then we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum and then we looked at emissivity, absorptivity and then we looked at the earth as a whole, calculated the equilibrium temperature and all that. And then we went to the equation of transfer which is very much useful in remote sensing, then one dimensional plane parallel approximation where everything is a function only of z then layer average, then we, we looked at vertical profiles of heating rate, then we found out what are the cancellation effects taking place in the troposphere, what are the cancelling effects taking place in the stratosphere. But there is, because of that only, there is a net cooling in the troposphere. At the end of the course, if somebody asks why is the troposphere cooling, you have a very scientific answer to that, okay. And in the stratosphere, everything cancels out. Then we also looked at, uh, continuing on this uh, equation of transfer, we looked at the Doppler broadening and the pressure broadening and then how you can integrate over wave number and if you have a sensor on the top of a satellite, how it can capture the radiation coming from clear sky, how it can capture the radiation through the clouds and uh, how we can do remote sensing. Basically three types, visible remote sensing which is available only during daytime. You take pictures, and you decide whether it is a cloudy day or a clear day. Then you go to infrared, can, you can get temperature on the cloud top. If you can get the temperature on the cloud top, let us say the temperature is minus 40 degrees centigrade and the surface is 30 degrees centigrade, we assume a lapse rate of 6, you can actually find the height of the cloud. Then you are now into meteorology and you have figure out whether it is a cirrus cloud or the cumulus or the cumulo, the cumulo nimbus called the CB, the cumulo nimbus cloud is the rain cloud, so usually at a substantial height. And we also, I talked about the, I also briefly mentioned about the anvil, okay, the cumulus and the cumulo nimbus anvil. So I told you pilots will not go into cumulo nimbus clouds and all that. Briefly sometime I mentioned, we did not go deep into this. Okay. So, then there is a microwave remote sensing. The microwave remote sensing, the microwave has the capacity to penetrate through clouds. But the microwave E is equal to H nu is very small. So, current levels of technology do not allow you to put a microwave on a geostationary satellite. What is the advantage of the geostationary satellite? Suppose this is uh, India. So, you can uh, have your, this is my inside 3D. Okay. So, at 36,000 kilometers, I can make it always focus like this. So, 24 by 7, it will give pictures of India, Kalpana, inside 3D, all that. But the microwave, I cannot put a sensor and pick up the radiation here. So, the microwave will be at a uh, height of 800 kilometers, then it will go like this. That is a, if it goes like this, it is a polar orbit. 
if it is like the like this it's equatorial orbit usually it will go like an inclined orbit then depending on the height you will figure out how many times it will cross chennai or india two times a day three times a day four times a day okay so they are called leo low earth orbit okay so the remote sensing itself we can offer a separate course and all that so then we looked at radiation and climate okay the equilibrium temperature black body temperature of the earth 255 kelvin the mean surface temperature is 288 and so on and then we solved some problems we looked at what is called radiative forcing 1 kelvin 3.76 watts per meter square and then we looked at uh, climate sensitivity and climate feedback so there is a gain called g which is lambda by lambda not sensitivity with feedback divided by sensitivity without feedback we figured out the feedback for water vapor clouds clouds what is the net feedback clouds is zero okay so and then yesterday we ran through a presentation where we looked at various forcings what about ice age what are, how do we prove that much of the climate change in the last century is attributable to man or anthropogenic we finally proved that it is uh, it is virtually certain or it is most likely that the last 50 years or 100 years the change in the global climate and the mean sea level rise and all these are attributable to anthropogenic causes and then if we extrapolate what is the situation in the year 2100 for various scenarios these are called as a1 a2 a3 a4 or b1 b2 in the nomenclature of ipcc intergovernmental panel on climate change they regularly do some assessment reports where large number of scientists work out based on the research and then based on various meetings they release the report now the fourth report has also come i am not i don't have time to discuss that my presentation was based on the third report you can see that there are projections varying from 0.5 to 3 kelvin change the worst is 3 kelvin the worst is 3 kelvin the best is 0.5 that is committed change the carbon dioxide will stay at 390 but that is also not going to happen there is a committed change there is a worst case scenario so let's be aware of this and then let's do mitigating measures there's no point in or they say spreading cassandras or saying that predicting tomorrow is doomsday and all that as engineers they will ask what are you so what, what what is new what is your solution that solution cannot be given only by engineers because it is a geopolitical social many things are involved if you ask people to not use their cars it's not going to work so you'll have to find fuel cell then they will say how to do a, like a petrol bunk do you have petrol stations to refill and this thing now you cannot run 400 300 miles with a fuel cell because it is very heavy and so there are lots of technological barriers to be overcome so we have to go slow now the the prius the toyota prius is a hybrid vehicle right so whenever you brake it re, uh, regenerates okay so there are some solutions carbon dioxide capture sequestration improving the efficiency of power plants going solar renewable so there are various technologies with which you need uh, that three degrees rise by 2100 you can bring it down okay that is engineers can give technical advice but this is ultimately a call which has to be taken by society the policy makers and all that so we we'll leave it at that stage because at one stage science will stop other things will the science if for example when it comes to war you will not think about optimization when you think about launching a satellite you will not minimize the cost the satellite, whatever be the cost it has to work right so this optimization the best possible scenario all that will be only in normal conditions okay so let us not worry about that now we are going to look at atmospheric dynamics so if you look at daily weather charts if you look at daily weather charts you have you must have seen on the internet or tv what is this and the waves isobars contours of constant pressure and a discontinuity How many of you the have the next class? Can you go to eight fifty five? Okay, last class. I will try to finish. This quantity here is called a front. 
just like a shock wave in fluid mechanics. The discontinuity, for example, if you have a cyclone, you have seen na? these are isobars. If it is 1013 here, it will be 970 or 980. Lower the pressure here, pressure difference is more. So, you know that that higher the pressure gradient, more will be the velocity. Okay. So, if there is a discontinuity in the, so for example, if there is some discontinuity here, not in a cyclone, in another situation, we call it as a warm front, cold front and all that, we are not getting deep into that. Usually, charts are prepared 3 hour intervals. And large so they are called synoptic charts. So much of conventional meteorology is called synoptic meteorology, where the starting point is the pressure, temperature, humidity from various stations. You get, you release forecast once in three hours, and then you put it on a large chart, and then you consider a large scale. That is synoptic meteorology. Whether it will rain in Adyar in the next 3 hours is not synoptic meteorology. That is very accurate. Whether it will rain in a football stadium is not conventional meteorology. <coughs> that is high precision now casting. In 0 to 6 hours on a very small region, I want to know. Then technology is different. You need a radar, satellite, radar, everything. But this, if you want to have over a large scale, then this is conventional meteorology. What is the problem with this? On this large scale, the effect of earth's rotation is very important. So, you cannot use a simple x, y, z coordinate or even the spherical coordinates without taking the earth's rotation. Earth's rotation will come in the governing equation which makes the CFD part of the problem complicated. You are getting the point? Effect of earth's rotation important. Okay. So, this will come as a Coriolis parameter. So, this needs to be included in the governing equations. Okay. Next, I am sorry I am going very fast. Dynamics itself is a 40 hour course in atmospheric science department, but in 40, 45 minutes whatever we can will I will try to simplify as much as possible without glossing over the fundamental concepts. Okay. So, the governing equations will be d is the material derivative, the rate of change of velocity you, you all know that this is the Navier Stokes equation in vectorial form correct. I hope all of you are able to recognize this is the NS equation. So, this is the frictional force. This frictional force you have to put mu dou v by dou v plus mu dou v by dou v, there is a Stokes hypothesis to 2 by 3 mu d whole square and all that and resolve that. That cannot be done for the atmosphere because the scale is 30 kilometer or 40 kilometer. You can do it for fluid flowing in a pipe. So, that is a difference. So, you put some bulk representation or some approximate formula for f dash. Correct? If you so you cannot do full numerical simulation like what you are doing. For example, there is a closed cavity. I want to do full three-dimensional natural convection situation. For example, three-dimensional simulation of flow in this room, it is possible to do with modern computers. But to, uh, from Chennai to Singapore and uh, from Sri Lanka to Burma, on that domain, if you want that resolution, it is not possible. You are able to understand? Okay. Then each point you will have millions and millions and millions of nodes, the computer will, it will just take too much time or it's, it, the memory will not be sufficient. Okay. This is for a fixed frame of reference. But we need to have a rotating frame of reference. Correct?
What is this? <coughs> One by row. That is the curl of the velocity vector, right? Curl of V. Okay, so or um, okay. plus g, where okay, I just check the exactness of this, so that we do not make mistakes. Yeah, that's no, okay. I think. Okay, so this is uh, the gravity term. What is omega? Okay, so just uh, calculate this. Time period is please get omega. I'll just Sorry, got it? Seven point two nine ten to the power of minus five. Mm. So at the end of the course, please remember this value. The angular velocity of the Earth is seven point three into ten to the power of minus five radians per second. So just remember this value. Okay. So now I will draw a picture. Okay, so this is the azimuthal angle. So there is nothing, there is no sphere here. So this is the earth. You cut it here at the equator, that is called the equatorial plane. Okay, so the, which is the equatorial plane? Correct? Uh, this one. Okay, that is the equatorial plane. Okay, now this R, this is the azimuthal angle. So this fellow is rotating like this. So that I call it as omega. This fellow is spinning like this. Okay, he is spinning like this, and then our coordinate system is a little. Z is Z is here. Huh? Then, so this I call it as north east, north east and z. Okay. So, what are the three axes? Z is the local vertical. Okay. <coughs> the xy plane is tangent, is tangent to the origin. Okay, it is tangent to the surface at the origin. Okay, but the problem is 
coordinate system like this is valid only near the equator as you go up. So, some gut bud will take place, okay. So, something has to be done. Before that, I will give you the what is the curl of the velocity vector ijk 0 cos phi sin phi and I will give the th take the 3 components as u v w. Do not confuse this v with this v. If you want you can do like this. What is phi? I have already defined here. So, you want to call it as a model of the earth or I do not know. Some model of the earth with coordinate system and So, what do you understand from this? If you have a north east and z coordinate and the earth is spinning and the radius is continuously changing from the equator to the pole, it is better to go for a spherical coordinate system, okay. A spherical coordinate system is better. Then simplifications, the equations, the equations which we saw are formidable to solve, okay. So, we need some simplifications on this. First, we set the frictional force to 0, so, the approximation is okay, I mean we have, we have to, we have to move on, right. So, the friction is set to 0 and V then we get the 3 equations. So, d u by d t We can spend hours deriving this, but we do not have time. What is the equation number for this? Four, five, huh? Four, okay. So, do not get scared, we are not going to solve this, and uh, in 20 minutes we cannot do much, right? So, I am going to simplify further and further and further, huh? but I want you to know this. is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time for each of the three components okay Okay, now look at uh, what I am going to say, hmm? u velocity, v, uh, sorry, uh, v velocity, w velocity. You looked at, you studied winds and all that, you know the sea breeze, land breeze, you have looked at, out of this u v w in the atmosphere, which is negligible? Ah, this one, if you have, if you have 15 or 20 meters, then all of us will be going up. But, so, this w is only few centimeter per second okay so these are the simplifications first simplification okay so certain terms involving w can be knocked off agreed <coughs>
therefore 2 um, 2 omega w cos phi is much much less than 2 omega v sin phi but when will this cup i mean when will this fail when the cos phi are, when the phi is very small when the phi is very small cos is very high sin is very low therefore though the w is much much less than v the terms will become comparable so near the equator this will come because that phi is with respect to the equator so strictly very are you getting the point ah so this cos will become very close to 1 this will close to 0 so this uh, so not valid near the So let us keep it, uh, let us remember this. Uh, the term in the okay. x coordinate of the so navier Stokes. When we wrote du by dt, sorry, sorry, when we wrote so du, du by, by dt, dt, the term was 2 omega, omega v sin phi minus 2 yeah. omega cos phi sin phi. 2 omega cos phi sin phi. One second, one second. Let us run through this. I will get back to the, the problem. So, except at very low latitudes, then 2 omega see whether it is makes sense. So, this is much much less than g which is 10 meters per second square. Now, I will write the equations. If I made a mistake there, you help me correct the equation so that the people watching the lectures get it right. Okay. Now with all this, are you getting that point? 2 omega u cos 5 is 10 to the power of minus 4 meters per second square, but g is this thing. So with respect to g, therefore these equations become Of course, the W term does not have the Coriolis component. Yeah, now oh, Rajesh, you please tell me whether any changes have to be made in the equation. So, this is called the Coriolis parameter. Important thing is dou u by dou u by dot is a function of dp by dx and f of v. Dou v by dot is a function of dp by dy and f of u. So it is coupled. Is that okay? Mm. Now we write some numbers for this. Five six. Huh? Now we look at what is called the geostrophic approximation. equations 5 6 5 and 6 what do they say leave the mathematics equations 5 6 equations 5 and 6 what do they say the inertia term is balanced by the sum of the pressure term and the coriolis term so we are looking at asymptotes or special conditions of this equation if the inertia term can be negligible then the pressure will be in balance with coriolis that is the geostrophic I come again, if the inertia term is very small, the pressure term will be in balance with the Coriolis. So, why are you doing all this sir? Question comes, no? So, why, what are you doing all this? You wrote all these equations, simplifying, simplifying all this. <coughs> Watch this beauty. 
suppose this inertia term is uh, it's a difficult to evaluate, you have to get u and take the derivative and all. If this is set to 0, okay, I know the Coriolis term, right? Okay. So, if I know what is the pressure distribution, I can get the velocity field. I can directly calculate the velocity field from the pressure, which is very important for synoptic meteorology without requiring a supercomputer. But you can ask me, sir, when will it fail? We will work out there is something called the Rossby number. For a particular value of Rossby number, this will not work. Okay? So, the geostrophic approximation is <coughs> set inertia to 0. I can get the two winds from pressure field. This is the geostrophic wind. Okay. So, we define a new number called RO. called the Rossby number. Okay. So, mid latitudes Ten to the power of minus four, huh? Is it minus four? Yeah, please calculate the Rossby number for mid latitudes. What is that? Uh, F not ten to the power of minus four, seven point two nine ten to the power of minus five. I'm approximating. That is all right now. Point seven in ten to the power of minus. Uh, I into cos five. That is cupping. I mean. Not 0, I mean so. So, what is that? Rossby number? 0 0.1, eh? correct? So, if the Rossby number is small, geostrophic approximation is valid. <coughs> so, what is the takeaway from this? If you are looking at large scale winds in the mid latitudes, Without solving a detailed CFD equations, you can get a handle on the wind speed approximately. Take a twist, take a twister or a tornado. Take a tornado. L equal to 100 meters. What will be the Rossby number? Very high. Geostrophic approximation will fail. We cannot use for a small system like the tornado or a tornado twister and so on. But you are looking at large scale, geostrophic approximation is good without the computer. If somebody gives you pressure, I can tell you approximately the velocity 7 meters, 8 meters, 10 meters per second. It will not be way off, it is a first cut approximation. Now, for these small systems, what should we use? We use what is called the cyclostrophic approximation. Okay, that will be the last thing we will leave. So, valid. not valid near the, regardless of the system, it is not valid anywhere near, not valid for any system near the equator. In the mid latitudes also, do not use it to calculate the wind speed of a tornado, it will give wrong values, understand.
The last thing we are going to study is cyclostrophic Cyclostrophic approximation is at low latitudes f is small for a system like a cyclone okay, where the centripetal force or the centrifugal force is balanced by pressure. yes very good the centrifugal force is balanced by the pressure then the equation normal pressure gradient dp by dn multiplied by 1 by rho the minus is to take care of that the dp by dn is negative so it will give you the velocity r is opposite of dp by dn sorry v okay the last problem of the course problem number any problem okay so what happens to r of course Ah, okay. The last problem for, for the course, problem number ah, 52, okay. Problem number 52, estimate the wind speed in a cyclone, estimate the wind speed in a cyclone. at town A, located 25 kilometer located 25 kilometer radially from the center of a cyclone. Isobars are circular and equidistant. Isobars are circular and equidistant and are drawn at intervals of 2 h pa. The distance between two isobars being 10 kilometers, the distance between two isobars. What is the distance I gave you? Oh. Is this? Yeah, please calculate the maximum speed, calculate the wind speed. So you know dp by dn, the density you take it as 1.2, huh? density you can take it as 1.2 kilogram per meter cube. How much is it? 20? Is it? 20 meter per second, okay. Let us do this. So, V equal to R is
Ah, divided by. Ah, so V equal to. Where is the density? Ah, okay. Ah. What is the speed in kilometer per hour? Good speed, ah. Huh? Huh? 5.6 okay now if you take the radius to be 50 kilometer and this is 4 for example let us take this is 1 the other one is So, every 10 kilometer, if it is 5 h power, what is V2? And do it for town B at 50 kilometers. Town B is at 50 kilometer and it is 4 h power for every 10 kilometer. What is V2? What is it again? Mm. So, as the isobars get crowded, as the isobars get crowded, the gradient increases. So, the cyclone becomes more and more powerful. The winds will be higher. Okay. I leave it as an exercise to you. If you use the geostrophic approximation, you will get an absurd answer. You have that no u equal to 1 by f of rho into dou p by dou y. If you do that, take the dou p by dou y by dou p by dou n, use the Coriolis, you will get some silly answer. Okay? Because you are not supposed to use the geostrophic uh, approximation for this. So that brings us to, is it okay? So that brings us to the end of the course. So I already summarized the course in the beginning itself. So in this 40 hours, we looked at the various components of the earth system, then the thermodynamics then radiation and climate, radiative transfer, climate science and atmospheric dynamics. The takeaway is basically <coughs> climate is weather average over time, weather is largely de de uh, dependent on many things like not only solar radiation but winds and other phenomena. The climate is largely determined by radiation. Last 100 years the, uh, the climate of the earth is definitely changing and is more like it is virtually certain that it is because of anthropogenic causes. There are some mitigation measures which you can take uh, with which you can uh, reduce or mitigate this increase. Various tools are available for you to study the weather. Various tools are also available for you to study rain, tornadoes, various storms and with the help of numerical models and, and satellites, we have reached a stage where we are able to predict next 6 hours accurately what happens that is called now casting. Next 72 hours what happens which is called forecasting and you are also able to do seasonal forecast of monsoons and, and long term forecast is basically climate sensitivity, climate change studies and so on. So it is a relatively new discipline, less than 100 years old, but lot of excitement is there uh, because it can combine analytical methods, numerical methods and experimental techniques and satellites and so on. So if any of you are interested in doing further studies, you are encouraged to take advanced courses, do your research or project or okay, because it is directly related to the environment. Thank you very much.